and in the tradition of Bolivar, Martis, and Martin, etc. And he says, after Fidel Chavez, and after Chavez Morales, and after Morales, our great continent will throw up other people. What's the big deal? And that is a good way of looking at it. Because it looks at it from the perspective of the whole continent and not from the, part, on the, from the vantage point of simply one country. And this continental vision, which of course, as Hugo Chavez reminds us many, many times, comes from Simon Bolivar, the liberator, who had this dream. And it was a dream which was betrayed during his own lifetime. Alas, but it was a very noble dream. And this dream has now been revived. So many people think that Chavez is using Bolivar in a sort of, why is he using him? Well, he's not using him. He actually believes in that dream. And the fact that many, many people are now forced to go and read Bolivar is a very good thing because many of the things written in that period make a lot of sense today. Bolivar was successful in driving out the Spanish Empire from Latin America, and he refused to give up till that was done. And if you read the historical accounts, both in history and the amazing novel of Garcia Marquez, you see that the desire not to stop till the job is finished, a refusal to compromise. Many times compromises were offered, many, many times. And he said, I'm not going to do it. Because if you compromise, they will stay in this continent for times to come. They will use the compromise, make their bases, and stay. And that is a very interesting idea from Bolivar. And this is an idea which Hugo Chavez has learned very well. And that, by the way, explains sometimes when he appears to people to be slightly over the top. He's not that. At the back of his mind is this notion that my job is not going to be done until and unless the successors of the Spanish Empire in our continent are gently, not by violence, but gently removed as far as we are concerned uh, out of this continent so the continent can be free again, can think again, can breathe again, can speak for itself again, can speak in many different voices to defend its integrity. That idea comes straight from Bolivar. And you don't understand Chavez unless you understand that. Because it's, his thinking is not dogmatic. It doesn't come from a particular philosophy. It comes essentially, as he says many times, from reading very closely the works of uh, Bolivar and Simon Rodriguez, another interesting utopian thinker from, uh, from that revolutionary period in, of the 18th century. So it's, it's, it's a leadership. The radical leaders of Latin America are leaders who have a real sense of history. And it takes me back you know, sometimes hearing the Chavez's speeches, which are very different from those of Fidel Castro, by the way, but what both share in common is an amazing sense and understanding of history. They know the history of their continent, these guys, and that gives their language enormous power when you compare it to politicians who only think about today. And then when they only think about today, the only times they think about tomorrow is when they are thinking where their bank balances will be after they are out of power. Where are the interest rates highest? That's what they think about. Because this is a neoliberal world in which money dominates everything. Money creates power. Money dominates politics. Without money, you cannot be elected president of the United States. That is not true in Latin America. Without money, you can be elected president of Bolivia, of Brazil even, of uh, Venezuela. You can be. But in the Western countries, increasingly, you can't. And so 
it's this understanding of history which gives them the strength, the political strength, because they know we have learned lessons from history, both from our victories and our defeats, and we must avoid what led to those defeats in the years that lie ahead. And so it was that most people had thought that the 21st century would open up and be the century of total domination of the world by the Washington Consensus. Everyone thought that in the middle of the 90s. Virtually everyone. And a whole swathe of people who once were progressive-minded, radical, socialists, Marxists, guerrilla fighters in this part of the world or that part, went with that tide. It is impossible to travel around the world today without running into people who were once on the left and who are now serving in neoliberal governments. <clears throat> All over the world, Latin America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, I often run into people I used to know in the 60s because we were on the same side at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they don't want to see me. They hide their faces and walk away <laughs> because they've got nothing left to say. What can they say when they're defending this order? That's the importance of what is going on in Latin America today. That is the axis of hope. And this hope is very important. And even if this hope has a utopian side to it, a belief in utopia is extremely important for the life of this planet. Because a world, Oscar Wilde once said, a world in which utopia is obliterated from the map is a world not worth living in. But these, what we are seeing in Latin America, in my opinion, are not utopian experiments. They are very realist, very necessary experiments. And here, too, Hugo Chavez has operated extremely intelligently, moving forward when he sees that the enemies have failed. Every time they fail, he moves forward. They try and uh, coup, he moves forward, cleaning out some of the more reactionary elements uh, inside the army. They try the strikes, he moves forward by creating a network of schools, clinics, etc. So he's been so far extremely clever in the way in which he has worked, and this is to our advantage. Because people who say to me, and often I debate Venezuela with uh, people from the right in different parts of the world, and what drives me crazy is when they say he's an authoritarian. I said, you know, I know he has friends who wish he was authoritarian. A few of his friends wish he was authoritarian, but he's not. And I said, I'll tell you why he's not. Because you give me the example of any other country in the world where the entire private media and television networks are implacably opposed to the government, hostile to it, have abused its leader in racist language which would not be tolerated in any Western country. When Veni Vision referred on some stupid show refer, referred to uh, Chavez as a monkey, where even so-called progressive intellectuals in private say, supposedly progressive intellectuals in private say, never trust a Zambo. A Zambo, for those of you who don't know, is someone of mixed black and indigenous blood. I said, in this country, all this has happened. And not a single newspaper has been seized or stopped. Not a single television station has been stopped. And I said, I wish the press in the United States and in parts of Western Europe was as energetic against its government as the Venezuelan press is against its president. But it isn't. That's the, that's the irony of it, that you compare it, you compare it to what is uh, going on in the West, where the media is getting tighter and tighter, and in Venezuela, 
where there's constant hostility and opposition. And by the way, what that also demonstrates is that the media isn't as all-powerful as we sometimes think. That if you have real popular support and genuine social movements, you can override the media. That's what they did in Venezuela. And that's what they will do in other parts of Latin America. And that's what could be done in parts of Europe. And of course, dare one say it, in the United States of America itself, where only a minority of people bother to vote. It can be done. can be done. And when people begin to turn to self-help and set up their own independent media networks, as has happened in this country, you know, they begin to get support. I tell everyone that Democracy Now! is a show which is watched in all parts of the world, even. People can get it on the web, and here it's either watched or heard by over two million citizens each day. That's a big, big leap forward for the independent media networks. And the reason that happens is because what people can see on that program, they cannot see anywhere else. On every, virtually every major issue is reported. And even mainstream journalists who can't trust the television they watch often turn to democracy now to see if there's a good story which maybe they could pick up if it's not too dangerous. <laughs> That's what they do. So they start watching that as well. And so the point I'm making is that what Venezuela has done and what the Latin American turn and the revival of hope has done is to make, to empower people in different parts of the world. That's the most important aspect of it, to give people an idea of their own strength and to make them feel that if the Venezuelans can do it, we can do it, not to mimic them, but do it in our own way to try and achieve the same results. And of course, they would not feel this if they thought that Venezuela was a brutal dictatorship. And in fact, no one ever calls it that, but the use of the word authoritarian is so common in virtually every major newspaper in the world that it's frightening the way in which these, this disinformation is spread and the lies are told. And so my, what I normally say is that you know, solidarity with the Venezuelans and the Bolivians and the Cubans and other movements developing in the continent, the Mexicans fighting for, for democracy, the Ecuadorians trying to change their own... It's that solidarity is all very important. One can't do without it. Help is needed. And especially solidarity in the sense of disseminating what the truth is about these societies and not what appears in the global media. That's all goes without saying. But ultimately, ultimately, real change will come when people move beyond solidarity and begin to create a different style of politics and a different style of organizing through social movements, uh, initially in one or two areas, then they spread, because what is obvious, and here I don't just talk about the United States, because this is a global phenomenon, that the impact of globalization and the total domination of politics by capital has meant that the democratic processes are themselves being hollowed out. And if you have parties of the center-left or the center-right who disagree with each other on very little, then people begin to get disillusioned with democracy. And if you have supposedly two political parties fighting for power, which have no differences at all on any major issue, then people have the right to ask that what is it that we are witnessing? Isn't this reminiscent in some ways of a one-party state, but with a one-party, but with two different masks, 
which can be worn at different times. And this style of politics is now, I think, actually incapable of defending democracy, democratic rights, democratic accountability. As we have seen with some of the laws that have been passed without any mainstream.